Hi, this is uh, Richard Hall from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa, and I can see a picture of me up there. <laughs> there we are, we're back on that, and we're looking at the uh, night sky uh, that we have in the Wairapa. What I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, this is a bit of a test run today, we're doing a little bit of an audio visual I make up and we used it out at the Stone Circle and so on. Uh, it's not specifically made for radio, although I've listened to it, a lot of it you can you'll follow it anyway. But if this all works, what we will do is we can make up some special programs for radio and TV at the same, at the same time. I always like at this stage to uh, thank uh, Dan Broughton, he's a friend of ours, who um, uh, uh, sponsors this this particular program so we're going to have a look this time at the night sky but before we go on to that i should mention that what some of the things that we're doing out here at stonehenge we're in the process of building a, a science center out there and uh, this center will include uh, geology of the wararapa uh, astronomy of course but also history and so on and so forth and so i'm working on a whole series of panels you can see for those of you on tv you can see some of these panels coming up now. So that's what I'm up to at the moment, working on that. But anyway, what we're going to be looking at is uh, the night sky. Oh, I should think, mention one other thing, is that what we're planning to do is place the biggest telescope in the uh, country available for ordinary people to have a look through. Right? And a picture of one of those telescopes is, is on the screen there for those who are on TV. Anyway, we're going to have a look at the wintry night sky. Uh, so here we go. Everybody, um, for some reason, uh, this fabulous audio visual that uh, Richard's prepared isn't coming through on the telly, and I know why. All right, Richard, if you want to set that up again at the start, then we can make this happen. Okay. Um, I love it when you can f just go, don't worry about me. Uh, okay. So, listeners, I'm not Richard Hall. But you know what I love about this? I've figured out what's wrong and sorted it. I love it when you can figure stuff out. Yeah, he's not as good as look, looking as me, is he? No, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Richard, shall we hit it? Yeah, hang on, hang on. Just yeah, yeah, okay. All right, All right, go, baby. All right. Yep, yeah, yeah. midwinter evening. At this time of the year the Milky Way forms a great celestial archway that rises in the northeast and passes directly overhead. This star marks the zenith, the point directly overhead. Looking behind to the south we see that the Milky Way sets in the southwest. At this time of the year, the Southern Cross lays on its side in the southwest. The Southern Cross is a navigational beacon. The long axis of the cross points to the bright star Achenar. Midway between the cross and Achenar is the South Celestial Pole. Drop from this point to the horizon and you are looking due south. At this time, brilliant Canopus, the second brightest star in the sky, also marks the direction of geographic south. Below 
move across the great ship of Argo Navis, for which Canopus' power sets in the southwest. Canopus hovers near the horizon. Above, embedded in the Milky Way, is the False Cross. The False Cross points to the Running Man. Can you see the Running Man? This is a cluster of 80 giant stars, 1300 light years away. Above the False Cross is the Diamond Cross. At the apex of the Diamond Cross is the Southern Pleiades. This is a cluster of 60 young stars immersed in a cloud of dust, gas and ice crystals that reflects the blue light of the hotter stars. The cluster is 490 light years distant. This bright pink glow, which is seen with the unaided eye as a bright patch in the Milky Way, is the Eta Carinae Nebula. The nebula, which is 9,000 light years away, glows from the ultraviolet light of hot young stars born within it. Above Canopus, and away from the Milky Way is the Large Magellanic Cloud. This is a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way which contains 10 billion stars. The Large Magellanic Cloud is 169,000 light years away. The small Magellanic cloud, which is 190,000 light years away, is being torn apart by the gravitational tidal pull of the Milky Way. Above Argo Navis, along the path of the Milky Way, are the bright stars of the Southern Cross and Centaurus. And Lupus the Wolf. On the southern side of the Milky Way, beneath the hooves of the Centaur, is the Southern Triangle. Above the Triangle is Ara, the Altar. According to ancient Greek legend, this is the altar upon which the gods of Olympus swore an oath of allegiance before their battle with the Titans. Akanar means river's end. It marks the end of the great celestial river Eridanus. Eridanus flows from Orion in the north, which at this time of the year is below the horizon. At the river's end is the firebird. Above Phoenix, high in the southeast, is a distinctive pattern of stars. This is Gus, the crane. The brightest star in Gus is the central star of a line of three bright white stars that line up in the southeast. The brightest, Fomalhaut, is the eye of Pisces Austrinus, the southern fish. Fomalhaut is a nearby white-hot star 22 light-years away. Recent observations have revealed that Fomalhaut is a very young star surrounded by a disk of dust and gas in which new worlds are forming.
Turning now to the north, the brightest star-like object in our evening sky is the planet Jupiter. Almost overhead is the Scorpion. The bright orange-red star Antares is the heart of the Scorpion. The double blue-white star Shula is the Sting. Antares is the brightest member of an association of giant stars located 520 light years away. Most of the stars are blue giants. Antares, being the most massive member of the group, has evolved more rapidly and is now a colossal red supergiant. Antares is immersed within a nebula of dust and gas, which reflects the light of the brighter stars. Here we see Antares from a hypothetical planet 750 million kilometers from the giant star. This is equivalent to the distance of Jupiter from our Sun. Seen from the same distance, our Sun would look like this. Antares is so large that if we were to place it where the Sun is, it would engulf all of the planets out to and including Mars. The giant star pulsates, varying in brightness between 4,400 and 10,000 times the brightness of the Sun. It has a companion star, which is itself 160 times brighter than the Sun. It orbits around Antares in a period of 900 years. In contrast to the red supergiant, the companion appears greenish in colour. In Europe, in medieval times, the scorpion rose in the heat of summer. This was the time of the plague, and Scorpius was associated with death. The fate of every person, whether they would live or die, was weighed in scales held in the claws of the scorpion. The plague ended when the archer rose. Whereas the scorpion symbolised darkness, Sagittarius represented light. The archer aimed his arrow at the scorpion and drove darkness and death away. Note that most northern constellations appear upside down when viewed from the southern hemisphere. And it's Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. On the southern side of the archer is a distinctive circlet or wreath of stars. This is Corona Australis, the southern crown. Behind Sagittarius is a large V or horn of stars. This is the sea goat Capricornus. About 2,500 years ago, the Sun was in Capricornus at the time of the December solstice. The latitude on Earth, 23 and a half degrees south, at which the Sun appears directly overhead at noon at the December solstice, became known as the Tropic of Capricorn. Since that time, due to precession, the December solstice has moved into the neighbouring constellation of Sagittarius but the Tropic of Capricorn retains its ancient name. These are the constellations of the Zodiac. The ecliptic, which is the path of the Sun and the plane of the solar system, runs through these constellations. The paths of the Moon and planets also lay close to this line. 
December 22nd, the Sun will be here, at its most distant point south of the equator. This is Midsummer's Day, the Southern Hemisphere's summer solstice. It will be midwinter in the Northern Hemisphere. At that time we won't be able to see these stars because they will be in our daytime sky. In modern astronomical star charts, the Sun passes through a 13th constellation of the Zodiac. This is Ophiuchus, the serpent holder. He is the mythical healer, a forerunner of Hippocrates, whose reputed power included the ability to raise the dead. The serpent he holds is a symbol of his power. To this day, doctors still use the serpent as a symbol of their profession. The arrow of Sagittarius points towards galactic centre. The direction of the centre of the galaxy is located here, beyond the dark clouds that lay along the plane of the Milky Way. These dark cosmic clouds of dust and gas blot out the light of more distant stars and completely obscure our view of the galactic centre, which is 27,000 light years away. Infrared and radio telescopes, however, are able to peer through these dark clouds. the centre is a powerful radio source called Sagittarius A. The energy source comes from a titanic black hole that is devouring matter at the rate of our solar system per year. The black hole is at the centre, surrounded by an inferno of energy. As the matter falls towards the hole, it is heated to millions of degrees. The hole is 250 million kilometres in diameter. In our solar system, it would fill the space occupied by the orbit of the Earth. The hole has a gravitational power of two and a half million suns. And anything that falls into this hole vanishes from the universe. This, the great central hub, is the most brilliant region of the Milky Way. The dark clouds are the raw material from which new stars are born. Within the dark clouds we see glowing patches of light. These are stellar nurseries. When new stars are formed, their ultraviolet light illuminates the gas in the surrounding clouds. This is the Lagoon Nebula star-forming region located 5,200 light-years away. The nebula is illuminated by the intense ultraviolet radiation from a massive, ferociously hot new star. The star is here, shrouded in glowing gas heated to a million degrees. Emerging from the nebula is a cluster of newly formed stars. Close to the Lagoon Nebula is another star forming region. This is the Twyfid Nebula and it is located in the same vast dark cloud as the Lagoon. The blue colour comes from ice crystals that reflects the blue light of the hot stars. The pink region comes from hot ionised gas. It forms a crater in the cloud with a giant white hot star at the bottom. The dark filaments have been ejected outwards and are above the crater. Structures on the edge of the crater are silhouetted against the hot interior.
Cosmic Slug. The figure of Ophiuchus consists of two constellations. The serpent that he holds is a separate constellation and is split into two halves. The head to one side of Ophiuchus, the tail to the other. It is the only constellation that is divided into two parts in the sky, but both halves count as a single constellation. In the tail of Serpens is one of the most famous objects in the sky. This is the Eagle Nebula. It is illuminated by a cluster of stars that has recently formed within the cloud. A torrent of radiation from these stars is eroding the surrounding cloud. The Pillars of Creation like an ancient rock outcrop, these dense columns of dust and gas erode more slowly than that of the surrounding cosmic landscape. Each column is about one light year long. As the top of each pillar is slowly eroded away by the ultraviolet radiation from the giant stars above, proto-stars stars in the process of forming are uncovered. Flying up the Milky Way from the north are two great birds. On the tail of each bird is a bright first magnitude star. Altair is 17 light years away, which makes it one of the Sun's neighbours. Altair is a white hot star, 11 times brighter than the Sun. Its ellipsoidal shape is due to its rapid rotation. Cygnus is also known as the Northern Cross. In the cross is the X-ray star, Cygnus X1. This was the first black hole to be discovered in the galaxy. This is the great rift in Cygnus, a large dark cosmic cloud that divides the Milky Way into two. Hidden within the cloud is one of the largest and most luminous stars in the galaxy. An infrared telescope peers into the cloud. Shrouded in glowing gas is IRS4 Cygni, a star that is a million times brighter than the Sun. Between the two great birds are two small but very distinctive constellations. These are Sagittar, the arrow, and Delphinus, the dolphin. Below the arrow is a larger but fainter constellation. This is Valpacula, the fox which carries the goose. In 1967, this constellation was the site of an astounding discovery that revolutionised our knowledge of the universe. Here Cambridge astronomers discovered the first pulsar. Also to be found here is the most conspicuous planetary nebula in the sky, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula. We see glowing shells of gas that have been ejected from a dying star at the center.
To the left of the cross, almost due north, is the bright northern star Vega. To Māori, this is the sacred star Whānui, that rises in the autumn dawn twilight. Whānui is a great chief, who sails from the north to tell the people to lift the Kumara. At the same time, the stars of Scorpius, which in Polynesia is the fish hook of Maui, culminates overhead. Vega is a blue-white star, 50 times brighter than the sun. Its distance is 25 light years. Close to Vega is the apex of the Sun. This is the point in space towards which the Sun is travelling, taking the Earth and the other planets with it on a grand journey around the galaxy. The Sun travels towards this point at 120 kilometres per second. Vega is the brightest star in the constellation of Lyra. This is an ancient constellation representing the stringed instrument invented by Hermes and given to the great musician Orpheus. Above Vega, between two stars on the strings of the Lyra, is a famous celestial object. This is the Ring Nebula, the wreck of a dying star 2,000 light years away. The glowing rings are shells of plasma that were once the outer layers of the star. At the centre is the white hot core of the star. With time, measured in billions of years, it will cool to become cold and dark. Striding over the northern horizon is a mythical demigod, Hercules. He stands above the celestial dragon, Draco, of which only a minor part rises in New Zealand. On the back of Hercules is the famous globular star cluster, M13. This ancient star cluster is at least 100 light years in diameter and contains about 300,000 stars. M13 has a distance of 23,500 light years. A little to the west of Hercules is the Northern Crown. In the northwest is the fourth brightest star in the sky, Arcturus. Arcturus is a red giant star, 130 times brighter than the Sun. Its diameter is 23 times that of the Sun. Arcturus is an ancient star from the galactic halo. It has an age of 10 billion years, more than twice that of the Sun. Arcturus is the leading star in the constellation of Boötes. Right, this is uh, Richard back here with uh, just before we um, sign off, just to remind you that Stonehenge Art Hero is open on five days a week at the moment, from Wednesday to Sunday, and public holidays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. with guided tours at 11 o'clock on weekends and holidays. Also, we have a, 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 a a regular observing evening looking at the stars, right? That's the first Saturday of each month. So the next one coming up will be on September the 7th. And so this is Richard signing out. <laughs>